to discuss today is uh, some work uh, we have done on uh, ancient solutions to geometric uh, flows. Uh, we have a project to trying to understand uh, such solutions and I uh, will give uh, an overview of uh, what we have done and many open questions. Now, excuse me, because I think I need to do this. Let me just make sure that it works. Perfect. Okay, so um, I would like, um, let me just give you the definition of an ancient or eternal solution. An ancient solution is a solution to a parabolic equation which exists uh, for all time from minus infinity up to some time capital T. And usually we say that the solution is eternal if uh, capital T is plus infinity, which means the flow lives from minus infinity to plus infinity. Now, with um, parabolic equations, because we all know that uh, time is not reversible, those solutions tend to be very special. So we don't have many such solutions. And we would like to understand these solutions because many of them naturally arise at blow-up limits near singularity. So you focus uh, at the singularity, you rescale, and you end up with uh, either an ancient solution or an eternal solution depending on the type of the singularity. So understanding, being able to classify those solutions, of course, is related to the classification of singularities, to the understanding of singularities, etc. So what I would like to discuss uh, is uh, uh, some work uh, related to uniqueness of uh, ancient solutions uh, in geometric flows, uh, in particular the mean curvature flow, the Ricci flow, and the Yamabe flow. And uh, also uh, some examples that we have where we construct uh, new types of ancient solutions from the gluing or the merging of solitons, which are self-similar solutions uh, uh, in certain cases traveling waves. And uh, I would like to point out uh, some new techniques, uh, future research directions, and uh, a lot of open problems that we don't know how to do. Okay, so I have given you already the definition. And uh, so the self-similar solutions, of course, are examples of ancient or internal solutions. And they're usually uh, very important models of singularities. But often uh, there are other, okay, there are other, um, let me just give you some examples, first of all, of uh, such solitons, of course, the contracting spheres. These are the most typical and trivial solutions. The cylinder, most of the times, the cylinder will be shrinking depending on the flow. And then uh, are the translating solitons, which a lot of times they have this shape, um, although this uh, cylindrical part extends all the way to infinity. So this is one soliton with a cylindrical part extending all the way to infinity, and that's another soliton moving in the opposite direction. So this is moving to the right, that is moving to the left. So now, uh, some of us at uh, their work on geometric flow, they know this old technique uh, introduced uh, by Richard Hamilton, which has been very useful into classifying singularities, um, in particular type two singularities um, that uh, arise uh, after, uh, that after are scaled, they give the rise of eternal solutions. So this technique is based on rescaling at a very specific way at the singularity, near the singularity, so that at your limit, you end up with an eternal solution with for which the curvature, which is something that controls the singularity, uh, achieves a point-wise maximum in interior maximum in space and time. And the fact uh, that this is happening makes this eternal solution to be very special, and the strong maximum principle helps you to classify the singularity. 
On the other hand, uh, there are, because uh, this, these are really very special solutions, it turns out uh, that those solutions obtained, as, those eternal solutions which are obtained with that very precise blow-up procedures are solitons. On the other hand, uh, there are other uh, interesting um, eternal or ancient solutions that uh, they're obtained for, from the merging or gluing of solitons. And this is a picture that comes all the time in these flows. So it's these two solitons that I showed you before joined by the cylinder. Again, I didn't have so much space, but the cylinder as T approaches minus infinity uh, becomes longer and longer. And again, this picture is a picture close to minus infinity. As you go forward, I mean, most of the examples, something compact like that will become more and more spherical and eventually it will contract to a point and it will look like a sphere. And other types of uh, singularities uh, look like that. For example, two spheres glued with a little neck. So the obje objective is uh, how to construct such examples and how to classify, uh, how to prove uniqueness theorems that classify such examples. Okay, so, so usually in, when you try to prove a Louisville type theorem for such equation, you need to make some assumptions. For example, the Louisville theorem for harmonic functions is used that uh, some boundness. And in geometric problems, usually the assumption is a, a bound on the curvature. Um, for example, a lower bound, like no negative curvature, a upper bound, that like the curvature is bounded. And um, in these um, parabolic problems, uh, there is a classification that uh, appears as type one and type two. So this um, refers to how the curvature behaves as t approaches minus infinity. And usually, some, as t approaches minus infinity, most of the uh, flows which uh, were forward contract, backwards they extend. So the curvature becomes smaller and smaller because your object is bigger and bigger. Nevertheless, uh, after you do like a type one scaling, if the curvature is bounded, then the ancient solution is called type one, and if the curvature is unbounded after that scaling, the solution is called type two. And other conditions which help us uh, classifying those is the so-called non-collapsing condition, which I will try to explain uh, in the mean curvature flow. So let me start uh, with um, a very nice result. Uh, we have the um, Hatem is uh, one of, um, uh, it's by Marilyn Zag, uh, regarding the ancient solutions or eternal solution of uh, um, the equation that is obtained after you rescale the semi-linear heat equation. And the result is more general, but to make it simple here, let's assume that U is non-negative and you consider a solution of the semi-linear heat equation in the range of exponent between one and n plus two over n minus two. And why, of course, this is one of the like uh, most basic uh, classification result. It's a very difficult result. Uh, the proof is uh, very involved. And I am especially interested in that because uh, these uh, type of equations arise um, in geometric flows and you will see uh, they arise, uh, of course, um, a lot of these geometric flows are quasi-linear or fully non-linear. Nevertheless, um, uh, they, the prototype, uh, a lot of times for the, the evolution of the curvature, it's something like this. And so in this equation, if after, you've, after you perform a type one scaling near the singularity, then you end up uh, with uh, a solution of this equation star. This is the rescaled equation. And since you have, uh, you have rescaled the time also, you, have, you ended up with an eternal solution, the solution that exists from minus infinity to plus infinity. And a very old result by Giga and Contel says that we have the boundness condition. So you have a uniform bound. And uh, so if you would like to analyze and to obtain more precise information about your blow-up behavior, then it's important 
to provi provide the classification of uh, these um, uh, eternal solutions. Now, in this case, we have a very nice Lyapunov functional. This was known for, for a while ago. And this Lyapunov functional already uh, can be used to tell us that as t approaches minus infinity or plus infinity, you will convert to a steady state. And there are only two steady states, the two constants, zero, and I call it kappa. And um, so the classifying these bounded solutions of this equation means that we need to analyze the, the orbits that connect these steady states. And we don't have many, many cases. And actually, it turns out that because of this energy that you have and is decreasing, the only hard case is to analyze the orbits that uh, connect uh, kappa, the constant kappa, the steady state kappa at minus infinity with the steady state zero at plus infinity. And now, in my geometric interpretation, you will see that this kappa means converges to a cylinder as t approaches minus infinity in these objects that I showed you. And uh, as t approaches plus infinity, zero means that somehow in the rescale case, uh, maybe you converge to the sphere, so you don't see anything. So the... Um, so um, the result of uh, Merle and Zag uh, is from 98, is that uh, the, the solutions that uh, connect the steady states, uh, the steady state kappa with zero, are just space independent. Therefore, they are the solutions of the ODEs. So again, in right, in this interpretation, the geometric interpretation, who have been the cylinders, nevertheless, you will see it's not exactly like that. And um, so the proof is um, quite involved. And uh, what it uses, of course, it uses, uh, since a lot of, we have a lot of experts in this uh, here, it uses, uh, of course, uh, knowing, um, analyzing the projections of um, the ancient solutions uh, as t approaches minus infinity into the positive zero and negative uh, eigenspace uh, of the corresponding linearized operator. And you work very hard to actually show that um, what, uh, if you look at the difference of two solutions, for example, in particular your solution with this uh, trivial solution, then you work very hard to show that what dominates is uh, one of the eigenfunctions corresponding to a positive eigenvalue. And this eigenfunction is constant in space constant in space, and then after that you work even harder to actually show that the constant in space eigenfunction correspond, show that the actual difference of the two solutions is constant in space. So that's the idea, and of course, in some sense, it's on the spirit of the elliptic uh, analog of uh, Gida's Nier Nierberg and Berestick Nierberg for the semilinear equation. Nevertheless, uh, this is a parabolic result and it's quite different. And there are other Louisville type results by many people, uh, but uh, again, it's along the, uh, I mean, the, the basic important result was that. Okay. And uh, now, um, there is another interesting result uh, that I don't want to, um, I don't have time to, to talk in detail um, by Koch, Nadirajvili, Seryagin, and Sfirak, where they classify bounded solutions of two Dinavir Stokes and three Dinavir Stokes, but with rotational symmetry. The 3D involves rotational symmetry and no swirl. And what is nice about this result, uh, which is quite uh, uh, simple, uh, unlike uh, in contrast with the Maryland Zap result, the proof is quite simple, and it really is based on a weak type version of the strong maximum principle for parabolic equations of this form, um, which is applied on bigger and bigger parabolic cubes that extend all the way to minus infinity. But it's a, it's a very nice and remarkable result, uh, I think, uh, because of the simplicity. And of course, it would have been nice if it worked uh, under no uh, symmetry. 
Okay, so now let's go to the more geometric equations, and I will start with the simpler one, which is the curve shortening flow. And I, these equations are very well studied, and if I start talking about the background on this equation, I will get nowhere. So let me just show you a picture of what is going on. You have a curve on the plane, which is the boundary of the yellow region, and it's a, it was back then a surprising result of uh, uh, Gates, Gates, Hamilton, and Grayson. Actually, the best result is through um, due to Grayson, which says that even if you start with something like this, eventually it will become convex. When it's convex, it will shrink to a point and it will become more and more circular. So this is the ideal situation and you we see it happen in a lot, a lot of other flows, in particular in the mean curvature flow, or maybe you don't wish that this happens because this is easy. Once this is happening, then you don't have many things to, many interesting things going on. Anyway, and um, so in terms of the curvature, the curvature kappa of the curve, in terms of the arc length, so this S is the arc length which changes in time, is the geometric equation. You see that uh, it satisfies one of our semilinear uh, parabolic equations. And typical examples of this, a type one example, of course, is always the contracting circles. And a type two are the so-called angular ovals or paper clips. And uh, the, the, they are just these curves that I, um, I have here, and the long curves are as t approaches minus infinity, and the, the as t approaches uh, uh, like uh, the vanishing time of the curve, they become more and more circular. Here, this picture has normalized the flow, so somehow this is the end. Uh, uh, so you normalize so the length is uh, like you don't, so the length of the. Uh, of what you end up with is like one or something. Okay, so, and uh, surprisingly, actually, you can really write these guys explicitly, so in closed form, and, um, and, uh, and once you have something in closed form, it helps you classifying it. So the, an older result uh, in, um, in collaboration with uh, Richard Hamilton and Natasha Sassum, um, we studied um, the, um, the ancient and convex solutions, and we proved that these are the only ones. So it's a uniqueness result. And the proof is quite um, easy because it happens that you have uh, two very nice monotonicity formulas on the curvature and the derivatives of the curvature, which you combine with very precise asymptotics uh, uh, as to what happens uh, when the uh, forward, actually, at the singularity forward. So somehow the information that something happens uh, where you, you know exactly what happens uh, at the um, vanishing time, uh, where the curve becomes circular, gives you uh, an, a bound that you can use uh, to classify. Uh, so this is easy. And you may say, why did you assume convexity? Uh, don't, what is uh, going on in the non-convex case. Um, we expect to have uh, other examples, and uh, uh, Sigur Anginet put this video in, um, on YouTube. So this is, I just took a photo of uh, one moment uh, at moment T. So again, you have a curve, which is the boundary of the yellow region, and uh, as t approaches minus infinity, it curves more and more around. Uh, and as t approaches, uh, this, uh, as t goes forward, it becomes simpler and simpler, and then eventually it will become uh, like a circle. And so this uh, example tells that, of course, uh, this uniqueness theorem it doesn't work uh, with convexity. And we will see in the mean curvature flow that there is also another con important geometric condition, the non-collapsing, that uh, plays a role. Okay, so let me just uh, now go to the higher dimensional case uh, of uh, mean curvature, which is the case of the mean curvature flow. And again, uh, let me assume that you have convexity for the moment, so you consider a convex, uh, closed, uh, let's say compact, smooth, hypersurface, and where you move at its point uh, in the um, uh, direction of the normal, you put a normal direction nu by the mean curvature. 
And uh, so if I put a negative sign here, this new point outwards, but I have a negative sign, so this means on a convex surface, of course, contracts. And um, so the problem, again, is understand uh, the ends in compact and convex solutions of the mean curvature flow. Now, uh, once you don't have the convexity, uh, you, you could construct uh, many exotic examples. I mean, Kerbach is well known for its many exotic examples. So it turns out uh, that in these geometric flows, uh, mean curvature here and Ricci flow as well, there is a so-called non-collapsing condition that plays an important role in this classification of ancient solutions and also the classification of singularities. So what it means in analytical terms, more or less, uh, is just if now my surface is the boundary of the domain kappa, so it's just uh, uh, the dark um, um, black boundary, then this non uniform non-collapsing condition with constant alpha means that at its point on the surface, you can put in the interior of the surface and the exterior um, a ball of uh, radius alpha over h of, over the mean curvature, and this alpha has to be bounded from above and below and uniformly in time as t approaches minus infinity. So it's an interior and exterior uh, boundary con uh, no, ball condition, but with the radius that is related to the curvature. Now it's a result, uh, so. Uh, so it's a result, a recent result of Haslofer and Kleiner that ancient compact and non-collapsed solutions are convex. So this, this non-collapsing condition is uh, pretty strong. On the other hand, uh, if you don't assume uh, the non-collapsing non condition, you have other examples. For example, a typical example is something that looks like a pancake. And this uh, radius of this pancake as t approaches minus infinity uh, goes to infinity. So it's a bigger and bigger pancake uh, with a bigger and bigger diameter. So on the other hand, um, uh, there is another result that says convex, compact, and self-similar mean curvature's ancient solution is the sphere. So convexity uh, with self-similar gives you the trivial solutions. Nevertheless, uh, there exist these solutions which are rotationally symmetric uh, with um, um, o, o, K cross O, N minus K symmetry. I will write it down. And um, so they're not self-similar. And they look, the picture is very similar to what uh, I showed you before. So you have these solutions that uh, they look again like this. So you have one solid on to the left, uh, translating solid for mean curvature flow, trans, um, uh, another solid on to the right, which means self-similar solution in uh, analytical term, and a cylinder in the middle. So these, uh, we call them the white ovals because these uh, were shown to exist um, in a not very precise way by Brian White back in 2003. Nevertheless, uh, recently, Haslofer and Herskovitz, they gave uh, a more precise uh, con uh, construction of the solutions. Their construction, though, doesn't give any asymptotics. It's a very geometric construction. It just shows that it exists. It's, uh, right. And uh, Sigurd Eingenent, um, in 2012, gave precise asymptotics uh, about uh, math asymptotics as t approaches minus infinity about the solutions. And so what we did uh, recently with, um, jointly with Sigurd Eingenent and Natasha Shesum is we showed that every solution, um, every rotationally symmetric, actually, solution of uh, ancient non-collapse solution of the mean curvature flow satisfies the mass asymptotics of Ziegler-Angenant. In particular, um, 
we proved geometric properties of the solutions. So we show that what is the exact size of the diameter as t approaches minus infinity and the exact size of the maximum curvature, even with the exact constant. And the maximum curvature, of course, is achieved at the tips. So it turns out that there is the ceiling there, there is the solid on, and there is a very long intermediate region. And of course, the cylinder, the, the analysis in the cylinder, it's very similar to the Merlin Zag and um, etc. But so, what is now the difference here? The difference here is that your surface, yes, the diameter becomes bigger and bigger as t approaches minus infinity, but you're dealing with a compact domain, and. Uh, also, so you would, what you would like, if you want to start your analysis, you would like to put some cutoff functions on the region where you see the cylinder. Of course, this region becomes bigger and bigger as t approaches minus infinity, and we have estimated its exact size. And we are managing, we managed to do it by actually using Huiskin's monotonicity formula, monotonicity formula, which allows us somehow to show that uh, when um, you put this cut of function and you estimate the error terms where you cut, what the L2 norm of what you have in the interior, it's much more substantial of the L2 norm of where you have it, where you cut, which means that actually you can put your cutoff functions. So once you can put the cutoff functions, you can start your analysis, and this means that you know your analysis by using now the linearized equation, your analysis will show you exactly what is happening on the cylindrical region. In particular, it will show you the size of the cylindrical region. Now, once you know that, uh, you use barriers to show that somehow this behavior that you have in the cylindrical region extends for a very long region, which is the, um, uh, this region where you have this, uh, the intermediate region. And once you have that, then you, you use your geometric arguments to take care of what happens at the tip where you see the translating solid. Okay? So that's more or less the idea. Um, of course, the, the problem is that these barriers, you have an ancient solution, so you need to, okay, the barriers always go forward, but you need to go arbitrarily far away as t approaches minus infinity. It's technical, I think I should stop here. And now, of course, these are um, asymptotics use symmetry, and um, we would, you eventually you would like to show that these ancient and compact convex non-collapse solutions are rotationally symmetric. So this is a work in progress. And uh, one way to go about it, there are two ways to go about it. So the first way is uh, trying to show that these asymptotics that I told you work without the symmetry. And actually, we only use the symmetry in a couple of places. Nevertheless, we were not able to remove it. Another idea is try to use a more geometric approach to show that the backward limits, the geometric limits, as t approach minus infinity, are geometric objects which tend to are rotational symmetric. Once you know that, then the recent techniques that have been developed by Simone Brendle uh, for classifying solitons uh, of uh, the 3D rich flow, um, steady solitons, um, which uh, we think we should be able to, prove, to use to prove um, uh, the, the rotational symmetry. Now, when you try, though, to classify backward limits, in the middle, you know that you see the cylinder. This follows from the monotonicity formula. But um, at the tips, you want to show that you see this translating soliton, right? But when you rescale near the ma around the maximum curvature of your solution as t approaches minus infinity, you end up with an eternal solution. And we cannot do the scaling that Hamilton does because uh, they will, we, we want to cover all possible situations as t approaches minus infinity and not a particular rescaling. And therefore, one way to is uh, you, we will need to know which are the eternal and convex solutions of the mean curvature flow. 
and since it's again a uh, uh, work in progress, uh, so the conjecture around is that eternal convex uh, entire graph solutions are translating Solden. And again, convexity is somehow equivalent to non-collapse condition. And um, so, and, uh, so once uh, you know they're translating solidons, there is a recent work of Haskloffer, which is again based on this work of Brendle that I talked about, uh, where it says that more or less uh, under some convexity assumption, the translating solitons, uh, uh, which are non-collapse, uh, are the, um, the ball, just they are unique more or less up to one parameter, one parameter family. And, um, but uh, this, you, <laughs> work uh, of Haslofer, of course, uses the non-collapse condition and uses the convexity condition. And in a work in progress with, jointly with Manuel and Juan Davila and Wei, uh, we construct non-convex translating solitons which in dimension bigger than or equal to eight. And of course, you can imagine that these are related to, uh, to the corresponding minima surface examples. Okay, so, so this is uh, what we know and what we don't know about the mean curvature flow. And um, let's now go to the Ricci flow. And again, it's a very well studied equation and uh, I will not uh, discuss it in detail, it's just a, just tell you, remind you that it's the evolution of a metric, GIJ, by its Ricci curvature. And uh, if you are, of course, uh, the most interesting case is the 3D case and then the 4D cases, but nevertheless, the 2D case, uh, also studying the 2D case, provides interesting examples that work also in the higher D case, because of course, the 2D case you can view it uh, as a 3D case where one is like uh, you cross with a line or something. So, so let me first discuss you uh, discuss uh, Ensign compact solutions to the 2D Ricci flow and then tell you what we know and we don't know in the higher D. So of course uh, the 2D Ricci flow is well understood as it goes uh, in terms of existence, uniqueness and asymptotic behavior, something compact it's known that it will shrink uh, to a point, and as it shrinks, it becomes a sphere, right? It becomes more and more, looks like more and more like a sphere. And this is an old work uh, by Hamilton and Ben Chow. So what we would like is to classify now these ancient solutions of compact solutions on the 2D Ricci flow. And because 2D is very special, everything can be written on the sphere, right? So, uh, and in 2D, the, all the information that is given on the Ricci flow is actually given by the scalar curvature. And um, in, uh, so by the uniformization theory, you can write your metric as a conformal factor multiplied by a metric on S2. So you end up with a very nice PD, which is a logarithmic fast diffusion equation, and this two comes because you write your, uh, um, your metric um, on S2. If you, had, uh, if you write it on, R on R2 by a stereographic projection, then this two is not there. And so providing the classification of ancient solutions to the 2D Ricci flow is equivalent to understanding the ancient solutions of this PD uh, on S2 and minus infinity T. Okay, and again, uh, which are our explicit examples? Explicit examples are the contracting spheres, and again, uh, a type two solution that looks like this. Again, the same story. And this is a solution which was found uh, long ago by applied math people who were looking at this uh, fast diffusion equation on RN, uh, King first and Rosen now independently. And uh, in terms of a conformal factor written on S2, it's a rotationally symmetric solution, 
and it has this very simple form. And if I had told you the form of this angenent 1D solutions for the curve shortening flow, it would have been a very similar form. So the story is similar, nevertheless, the Ricci flow, you have this conformal invariance, and the proof, at least the proof that we found, is quite involved. So it's once the Ricci flow is much more difficult. Okay, and I will not tell you much, but so the theorem is the only ancient solutions of the 2D Ricci flow on S2 are the contracting spheres and this King Rosenau solutions. And just um, tell you what uh, the proof involves, which involves a lot of things. Um, of course, it involves a lot of geometric considerations. So we're using as much as uh, we, we can uh, the um, the information from geometry, in particular, we know from uh, the Harnack inequality that on an ancient solution, R sub t, R is the scalar curvature, the, the time derivative of the scalar curvature is non-negative. So you have monotonicity. So what is really going on is um, that um, as t approaches minus infinity, you see something like that. And if you look on any compact set and you look at what happens to the curvature, you just see point-wise limit zero. It decreases and you see zero in 2D, R is zero on the cylinder. And if, when you, if you, there are only, if you really look at your manifold parameterized on S2, then what happens is that, and you'd say that these two points correspond, let's say this correspond to that, and that correspond to that, then these two points are the only points where the curvature concentrates. So you have a concentration of the curvature at these two points. Of course, you don't know that the points are two. You may know, you prove that at the beginning these points have measure zero, and then you need to use a lot of geometric arguments to actually show that these points where the curvature concentrates are just two. So for this, you need a lot of a priori estimates, you need monotonicity formulas, and you need uh, um, these techniques uh, that, uh, the old techniques actually, we use a, a very nice estimate by Brazis and Merle, which uh, shows us somehow that unless the curvature concentrates, everything is under control, and uh, therefore R will be going to zero. So anyway, so these all arguments allows us to just begin and characterize the backward limit as t approaches minus infinity. And it tells you actually that point-wise, it looks like it's supposed to use, look, the cylinder. Once you know that, then you consider a very special quantity that vanishes on all possible candidates for ancient solutions, and you show that this quantity decays in time using the maximum principle. You show that this quantity is no negative, and you show that this quantity goes to zero as t approaches minus infinity. And therefore, something which is no negative decays and starts at zero, it has to remain at zero. And from that, you uh, are able to somehow recover the solutions. Now, this method, uh, and then, um, Okay, there is another argument you have to argue separately for the spheres, because what uh, all the story that I told you first works here. For the spheres, everything goes to zero uniformly, R goes to zero uniformly, and you have to still work quite hard to say, okay, once the R, the curvature uniformly goes to zero on S2, then the only ancient solutions, the type one ancient solutions are the spheres. So all this proof is involved, it uses your geometric argument, but again it's based on the fact that we have an explicit formula for the solutions. Right? And the difference, for example, between this result and the result on the mean curvature flow that we don't know, the uniqueness of the angular ovals is that in the case of the angular ovals, the solutions are not given in closed forms. Therefore, it's not that you're looking for a quantity to show that it's uh, vanishing, etc. So you need to develop some new ideas. Okay, and, and the 3D Ricci flow is something that. Oops. 
Okay, wrong. The three Dirichi flow is open, the classification question. We, we are doing the mean curvature flow because we think it's simpler and it will give us a better understanding for the three Dirichi flow. And again, um, it's the same story that we expect. There is a non-collapsed condition. There are the translating solutions, the translating self-similar solutions, which are well known to exist. Um, Parliament found them, and the conjecture are the only ancient compact solutions of the 3D Ricci flow under non-collapsing condition are the uh, so-called per the Perelman solution and the spheres. And you need this non-collapsing condition because uh, if uh, without non-collapsing, there are some other interesting explicit solutions which were found by physicists because apparently there is a relation between the Ricci flow in that situation and uh, uh, physics. So the conjecture is open and it's quite um, challenging problems. Uh, lots of people are working on it. Uh, so we'll see who will uh, manage to provide uh, a better understanding. And okay, my last um, um, discussion, yes. How are those solutions made? I don't understand. Oh. Solutions of Perlman. Oh no, the Perlman are not explicit. Right, but how are they? It's exactly, it's a, somehow a little bit how they are made. They have two cigars somehow grew. Exactly. They are the same way, like the before we did the asymptotics, uh, in the mean curvature flow, uh, show the, they show, but it, with a very geometric argument somehow, that um, you can construct uh, solutions. But nothing, nothing like you are doing, nothing glued. Um, they, they just use totally geometric uh, arguments. So, so it's, um, um, yes. Uh, but the idea is, yes, you put two translating, more or less, uh, two translating solitons, and you fill it up in the middle. So, okay. So the last uh, thing uh, I would like to discuss uh, is um, uh, the Yamabe flow. Um, and again, I don't want to bore you with something that is exactly the same. It turns out that here is different. So let me just uh, briefly again tell you what is the Yamabe flow and what we know. So the Yamabe flow is somehow the higher, higher dimension analog of the 2 d flow because, again, you have a conformal structure. You have a metric uh, on, uh, on a stu on a sandless, say, that uh, it's conformally and it's um, conformally equivalent to the standard metric on a sand, and you evolve this metric in a given in this given conformal class by the scalar curvature, right? So you evolve the metric by the scalar curvature. And it's not necessarily to be, to be in a stew, uh, in a sand, sorry, you can be an, on a compact manifold. And this was introduced by Hamilton, having in mind to resolve, uh, um, uh, to, to construct uh, the problem, the Yamabe problem, to resolve the Yamabe problem, which was uh, then uh, afterwards, uh, after Hamilton introduced this flow, shortly afterwards actually, it was uh, resolved by Rick Shane by elliptic methods. Nevertheless, uh, so the idea is you have a metric, you flow it, and you evolve it at the end, and that ends up to be a metric of, um, of a constant scalar curvature. And this is the Yamabe problem, right? So, and, uh, so this problem, actually, the Yamabe, the resolution of the Yamabe problem using the Yamabe flow was done uh, by Simon Brandler, and there was a previous uh, in, uh, important works by Hamilton, Chow, Yi, and Svetlik and Struve. I mean, Brendle assumes a technical assumption in higher dimensions, but nevertheless, is most of the cases are there. So what I would like again is uh, look at the Yamabe flow on a sand and look, uh, trying to understand ancient and solutions. 
And there, here you have a very nice PDE, so it's uh, this, so it's analog, the higher dimensional analog of the log of the logarithmic fast diffusion equation. And um, this exponent is, of course, uh, what appeared in Manuel's talk, and uh, it's the elliptic critical exponent. And under stereographic projection, you, this equation is um, equivalent to that equation on Rn. And of course, the fact that you can take a solution on Rn and lift it on the sphere and end up with a smooth solution of the sphere is equivalent to saying that your original solution on Rn satisfies a growth decay uh, at infinity, like the one Manuel talked about. So again, we have the same story to begin with. So we have, uh, of course, apart from the contracting spheres, explicit solutions which were um, introduced, which were shown again by King. And this is how they look, the solutions look, their rotation is symmetric, and this is how they look uh, if they're written on Rn. So the so-called pressure function, which is V, to this opposite power here to the minus four over n minus two, you see if you take this expo exponent away, it's, they are polynomials in R, R is mod x, with coefficients depending on t, and it's order four. And if a, if a and b equals to b, then you can pull this out and you end up with the spheres, otherwise you have these other solutions. And uh, so this is very similar to the king now solution that you have for the Ricci flow. You, I haven't told you how you write it on Rn, but it's very similar. And uh, this ten, this ten, this both solutions are type one. In the Ricci flow, the, that, the second solution was type two. In the Yamabe flow, it's type one. And you may ask again the same questions. Are these the only type one solutions if there are any type two solutions? And the answers to these two questions, uh, the answer to these two questions is no. So both in both cases, you have many other examples. And uh, in a recent work um, with, um, uh, jointly with Manuel and King and Sassum, we actually uh, found um, that um, there are many more solutions. Again, they look like that, but now the soliton here, they are solitons, but they're uh, different ones. They move with different speeds. So I would just uh, take uh, three minutes to explain what, what, uh, what I want. And uh, this is in a very similar spirit to the work of, of, of an old work of Hamel and Dirashvili, uh, for where they construct similar driving wave solutions of the KPP equation. And I will explain in a second, so let me just tell you what it is. So we were looking, again, we have this fast diffusion equation, and you can work in many coordinates. You're assuming rotational symmetry, so because all these examples are rotational symmetric, and you can choose to work on the plane, on the sphere, or on the cylinder. So we choose to work on the cylinder. Why? Because, of course, as t approaches minus infinity, you see the cylinder. So then you end up uh, on the cylinder with this equation. So if you didn't have this, this would have been uh, what comes from KPP, uh, like this would be, be like, this would be, be like a semi-linear equation uh, of uh, the usual kind. But we have this, and because of this, the equation becomes fast diffusion, so you need to control the diffusion. So um, what uh, is characteristic is this, in this equation, which is very similar to the, um, to the equation uh, to, um, um, what you happens in the KPP equation is that you have a whole uh, one parameter family of traveling wave solutions with different speeds. And all of them geometrically look like this. Geometrically, again, if you rotate, etc., because it's one dimension, but it corresponds to symmetry, means that they, at infinity, because this extends to infinity, they look like cylinders. And what lambda, this lambda affects, which is the speed, right? It's related to the second order asymptotes because the cylinder, they're all the same. There's no lambda. But if you look at the second order asymptotics of the solution at infinity, then you see the cylinder. 
And you consider this, cylinder, this uh, self-similar solution, but of course you can consider the one that uh, it's, um, by, uh, by it's symmetric, and that's the other one. And you also have the cylinders. And so what we did in, um, in this work, uh, this is not difficult, uh, it's simple actually, is uh, we observed that uh, you can somehow uh, merge these three things together with subsolutions and super solutions, more or less. And how it works, it turns out that the trick here is to work in terms of the pressure function, which is the solution to this negative power. And more or less, the pressure of, your, uh, of that guy is the sum of the three things minus two. Again, the pressures. And why minus two? Because in the middle, this is one, this is one, this is one. Okay, three minus two gives one, which is the cylinder. And because these guys, this, you, you have considered the pressures at infinity before you had decay, before you consider the pressure. V at minus infinity and plus, you, you have a decay for V at plus infinity and minus V. If you consider V now to the Q, it becomes infinity at infinity. So the fact that you're adding things in the asymptotics doesn't really hurt you. So this is, um, so what you do is actually you construct uh, pres very precise barriers. Uh, the obvious barrier is the maximum of the three and the minimum is the sum where you add a co little correction term or exponen little co exponential term and the miracle happens and it works. And um, actually I was not expecting to work so easily, but it does. Now Hamel and Adirashvili uh, in that equation, they don't use super and sub solutions, they just use um, the heat kernel, they just estimate the error of approximation by the heat kernel. And the last slide is um, um, some other construction, a little bit previous construction, much more complicated than the one I just talked to you. Uh, of solutions, of type two engine solutions uh, that uh, with um, Manuel and Natasha Sassu, where we take uh, spheres and we glue them with uh, short necks. So this is what happens as T approaches minus infinity. Again, if you move forward, I had a good movie, but the file got corrupted. This, this, uh, <laughs> this uh, neck uh, becomes broader and broader and eventually becomes, right, becomes circular. Backwards, um, uh, become, it's very close to minus infinity, it's like this, and you can, merge, you can glue as many uh, uh, spheres as you want. And again, this uh, is uh, a parabolic analog of uh, gluing methods, and of course Manuel is one of our experts here. And uh, uh, this, uh, or in the geometric setting, or lifting gluing techniques were first done by Capuleas and then later by many people. And uh, so what we showed there is how to do somehow gluing in the parabolic setting. And there is a um, work of Brendan Capuleas where with different methods, uh, they construct ancient compact solutions to the 4D Ricci flow with something that I, I, it's just, a, it's not like ours and I have to read it. I haven't read it. They say that they, based, that they were based on Yes, they say. I Me neither. <laughs> Me neither. I think they, they were just inspired because the result is that, yeah, I haven't, I haven't read it carefully, I must say. So anyway, so uh, this is the story. And uh, again, um, it would be nice to understand uh, how we prove uh, uniqueness uh, of, um, uh, of uh, this um, ancient or eternal solutions in the case where the solution is not given explicitly. That's why I think the Maryland Zap result is relevant because uh, somehow the, the knowing, uh, okay, if you don't know anything, uh, you should start from knowing what happens in the middle, from analyzing the linearized operator, and then maybe try to prove uniqueness using that. And of course, also, I suspect that the geometry here needs to be used as well. So it's not, it can be not just be viewed as an analytic problem. So thank you very much.
So uh, you you needed to have a, a non-collapsing solution, a uh, non-collapsing condition. For yes, yes. For example, for the mean curvature flow, yes. Yeah. And uh, so you said that there is an example of a solution that does not. Yes, many. Yes, there are uh, at least one that I. Uh, it's not proven. It's the one I told you. It's a solution that can be visualized again, like a pancake. A pancake, you know, is like a solution. Imagine like the boundary. You look at the pancake and invite, imagine the pancake just to be the boundary of, uh, of the region where you have the pancake, right? So it's like a coin, all right? Look at your coin and imagine that the diameter of this coin or this pancake as t approaches minus infinity goes to infinity while the thing becomes more and more uh, thin. Oh, actually, maybe not. Maybe maybe not. Yes. And how you you obtain this pancake? You take the so-called Grim Reaper, which is the uh, the solution to the curve shortening flow. So you take um, this curve, right? Is the one. Right? Imagine that you take this curve and then you rotate it around, around, around. Okay. And then as t approaches minus infinity, you have more and more space to go because this, uh, this curve, uh, right, it's non, it's non compact. I will explain you if you would like. Sorry for, you are a student, for a student, I went a little bit too fast, uh, so many things. Uh, but. Uh, Yes, again, this is not a proof. This is like, um, we, nobody has shown that. But this is what we expect that is going on. Actually, Sigur Ragen is very confident and thinks, and I, and a lot of other, we will think that this can be true. But this is not, this is all what we suspect to have. Yes, a green reaper rotate. And then you put some more symmetry, you create higher D things. Okay. Yes? So uh, uh, my question concerns the existence or not of the notion of criticality in your problem. I mean, for the heat equation, for example, uh, if you take power 5, mm -hmm. you have subcritical in dimension 1 and 2, critical in dimension 3, and then supercritical. And when it, uh, about that, and when it, when it is supercritical, we have no classification. So given that most of the time you, you don't have a classification, can we say that your problems are somehow supercritical from a certain point of view? Uh, for the Ricci flow, at least in 2D, in the Yamabe flow, they are critical, right? Because they are this critical elliptic exponent. So you are in between, and then, you, okay, in the Ricci flow, and then for the, um, um, for the mean curvature flow, I hope I will get the classification, at least under the geometric. So I think it's more like uh, it follows in the category of your results, so in the subcritical. And uh, for the Ricci flow, uh, I will assume the higher D, I don't know if there is such, I mean, okay, R, it's like R, the R is 3D, maybe, you, and then, uh, Okay, if you look at the curvature, it's like the curvature square. So this should be like, uh, is it subcritical or, uh, I don't know exactly, but um, I will assume that these geometric problems, most of them are critical because they are usually, yeah. But uh, good observation, thank you. Ah, one Luis says. So maybe this is related. Uh, you use one case of the fast diffusion mm -hmm. that corresponds to the Yamada flow. Mm -hmm. right? And this is a very particular exponent that has a special critical. Yes. It means that, uh, according to you, that if you change the fast diffusion exponent, you lose all these geometrical properties, and maybe there is no justification. Again, for the Yamabe flow, I don't think, okay, maybe you can cook up a classification with putting, imposing, if you impose a lot of conditions. For the Yamabe flow, I somehow show that you have so many solutions that, okay, still you may have a classification in the sense that, oh, if you classify the limit as t approaches minus infinity as one of these objects and you put uh, radial symmetry, et cetera, et cetera, maybe you have. 
So what I expect is that for the other case of exponents of fast diffusion, maybe you still have uh, some of these examples. Not the one we did with Manuel, but uh, the other ones um, that uh, I talked about, uh, um, with the self-similar solutions glued, uh, you may, may still have them, uh, depending on whether you have so many self-similar solutions. We haven't really looked at it because it was already too many things to look at. There are, there are similar solutions with fast decay, for instance, when the exponent is not exactly m plus 2 over n minus. Yes, so maybe you could do something with that as well, so who knows. There are too many solutions. Yes, so that's why I put at the end the Yamami flow to show you this is a case where you have so many solutions around. Uh, so and ex anyway, in this, in this flow, it's kind of interesting to give us a um, prototype of how to construct, uh, to do, to construct solutions. Uh, but in the Yamabi flow, I don't even know that, because we know exactly what is going on in terms of classification of singularities. I, I'm not even sure that this classification result uh, has any geometric application. The examples, I think, with the examples, we introduce techniques that may be used in other geometric flows. Thank you very much.